whether it's sitting uh, sitting upright or lying down, it's up to you really. Uh, supine is a completely viable position for meditation, by the way, in case you were wondering. <laughs> Buddha taught for positions, seated, walking, standing, and lying. And the trick with lying down is just to make sure you don't fall asleep. So whatever you need to do, I like to lie down and, and rest my eyes gently at the ceiling so that I'm somewhat awake. Um, there are other tricks. You can let your arm be kind of flat on the, f the upper arm flat on the floor and then the other part perpendicular, the forearm. So if you fall asleep, it falls and wakes you up. In any case, take a moment to find a comfortable seat for about a half hour sit and begin to turn inwards, closing the eyes and coming home to the inner dimension of the body. Feel the breath flowing in and out of the body. I'm feeling that you're just taking one more step into the next moment and the next. Not a huge shift between the outer and the inner. As a way of committing to blending meditation with post-meditation, post-meditation with meditation, until your day becomes a seamless meditative experience. So feel... Any tension in the body, releasing it with the out-breath. You may feel the shoulders softening down away from the ears, while the spinal column seems to lengthen space between the vertebrae, lengthening up towards the crown, up towards the heavens. The chest is buoyant, shoulders relax down and back. And let the breath fill the body from the base to the top as you inhale, filling the belly, the chest. And then with the out breath, feel it release, the breath moving out of the body from the top to the base. And just like the shoulders releasing down with the out breath, let the jaw mirror that movement of release. Even feel some space grow between the upper and the lower molars. The mouth might even part a little bit. Notice, are you trying to hold the mouth closed? Is the tongue pushing against? the upper palate, soften all of that. And just let the tip of the tongue gently rest at the upper palate right where it meets the top front teeth. There's a suctioning of the, the cheeks that occurs when the jaw releases down. And feel how that softens the space at the inner ear and the base of the ears into the skull, behind the eyes. Feel the space of the brow, the third eye opening. As the natural intelligence of the body begins to take shape within you as you relax, feel the chin drawing slightly in towards the center of the throat, lengthening the back of the neck, creating space at the base of the skull. Notice when the space opens at the base of the skull, the breath changes. And 
and the belly softens. Loosen your belt line if you have a tight waist. Let the belly soften out and let the breath fill the belly as you breathe in and release and empty as you breathe out. And as you breathe in, also not only feeling the belly soften, also feel the side body and the back body, the kidneys, the adrenals receiving the breath, the low back softening, releasing any gripping or protection until you feel an enlivening of the full bowl of the pelvis. From the perineal floor, up to just above the navel, this full bowl being inhabited by the breath and the mind, the attention. This is called the seat of prana, the life force with each breath is fueled and filled, replenished and enlivened. Receive that gift of the life force at the hara, the navel center. And the bowl of the pelvis. And that relaxation spilling down through the hips, into the legs, the feet, all the way down to the soles of the feet. The arms are relaxed and the palms resting on your thighs, palms down. It's just resting the body in its natural state, aligned with gravity, at ease within itself, like a mountain, still and stable, yet completely free and relaxed. And settle the breath in its natural state by just breathing naturally like a sleeping baby in a crib. No control, no effort, no restriction, just breathing naturally. Again, checking with the jaw, the face, making sure there's relaxation washing over you. Softening more deeply into meditation with each out breath. Enlivening the body, the breath and the mind with each in breath. Notice the mind coming in, wanting to steal the show. It feels a good thing happening in the body and with the breath, and it wants some, some of that. So entice it to ride the breath as it flows in and out of the body. Invite the mind to join this lovely party. 
settling the body, the speech, meaning the breath, in their natural state. The mind also settles in its natural state as it unwinds from its compulsive ideation and alights in the moment, the present moment. And its anchor is this lovely, silky breath flowing in and out of the body. it's important with the mind to give it plenty of space to roam, even though you're inviting it to the breath. There's also a quality of spaciousness. It's said like a herdsman on an open, grassy plain, reclining on the hillside, alert yet passively watching his sheep graze. Your awareness just watches thoughts as they rise and fall, come and go. But without clinging, without grasping, just observing. In this large open field of the mind. If you wish, you may slightly open the eyes and rest in this more Dzogchen approach of settling the mind in its natural state, or you may rest with the eyes closed as you wish. If you open the eyes, soften the gaze so there's not a staring quality, but the The muscles behind the eyes are relaxed and blink when necessary and soften the gaze. Soften the jaw. And with each in-breath, you may wish to gently oscillate between brightening, making more crisp the awareness, and then with the exhalation, releasing into deeper relaxation. A natural oscillation, clarifying with the in-breath, releasing and opening with the out-breath.
from time to time, checking with introspection, how is my attention, have I drifted into dullness? If so, then brighten with the in-breath, turn up the inner luminosity, maybe open your eyes if they're closed. Or on the other hand, with introspection, if you detect that you've spun out into excitation of agitation, thinking a lot, habitual thinking, then release with the out-breath into deeper relaxation and stability. Maintain a constant thread of mindfulness, moment-to-moment awareness of the present, imbued with that wakeful luminosity. Luminosity of awareness, like the sun ever shining. Illuminating the darkness, evaporating the fog of delusion, dullness, There's nothing to do to find that luminosity. It's always shining. And rest from the vantage point of awareness. Watching thoughts come and go. Releasing, free of grasping, free of distraction. Settle the mind, the breath, and the body in their natural state. Now we'll shift into the Tonglen practice, having done shamatha as a nice stabilizing, relaxing, clarifying. In a sense, preparation for Tonglen. 
the sending and receiving this compassion practice that's so integral to the Lojong teachings. The Tong is the sending of well wishes, of prayer, of healing, of goodness, the remedy. The Len is the receiving or taking, the taking of the hardship, the delusion, the confusion. The Tong is with the outbreath, the sending with the outbreath, the Len, the taking is with the inbreath. So let's work with the breath here for a moment and this orb of luminous sunlight at the heart center, the heart chakra. Let's feel this luminous orb of light, maybe the size of an orange or grapefruit, at the heart center, beaming light in all directions, permeating your whole body, the pores of your body, out through the pores. This symbolizes your indestructible nature of mind, the Buddha nature, your own luminosity, and the seat of the soul, the heart, the chakra. And as you breathe in, imagine that you're taking in the form of a dark, smoky vapor that touches that luminous orb at your heart, transforms it, purifies it, and breathing out a cool, clear, luminous light with the out-breath, just working with the rhythm of the breath for about five more breaths. The in-breath is taking into the heart, the out-breath is sending out from the heart. This is a heart-centered breath. And you feel as if you're breathing in through all 360 degrees directly into the heart space. And breathing out all 360 degrees, up and down, left and right, all around. Get used to that beautiful rhythm of breathing in, transforming, healing, purifying. Breathing out, sending, making the offering of goodness in all directions through light. And now, having established the rhythm, let's work with ourself for a little while. So often we leave ourselves out to dry, alone, without much love or care or attention. So in the Tonglen teachings, it teaches explicitly to begin with yourself. So take a moment to feel if there's any part, any aspect of yourself that's been pushed away or ignored, denied exiled. There's some thought that's been hovering around that you may have been ignoring or pushing away, or a feeling, a hope and a fear whatever that might be, and just imagine that you're inviting that feeling or those feelings into the heart space with the in-breath in the form of that smoky vapor coming right into the heart center, that light, transforming it into whatever remedy, whatever is healing for that part of yourself. Breathing that out and letting it suffuse your body, making that offering to your own being, your own body, your own mind. The in-breath is like an invitation for it to come home into the heart, aerating the heart with the breath. The out-breath is 
a feeling of whatever might ease that pain. Let that remedy suffuse you. Continue like that for about five more breaths, working with multiple things or just one thing. Let this be spacious and intuitive. Just feel it. And now we'll bring to mind a loved one. We'll work with another. Bring to mind in your mind's eye someone towards whom you feel great affection, care, who may be suffering now, who may feel alone or in despair or working with an illness, whatever it might be, however large or small. Bring to mind a loved one, friend, sibling, parent, partner. See them before you as clearly as you can. And work with just one right now, even if there are multiple. Just choose the one that needs you know, a little love, a little attention the most. And see them before you and imagine that whatever it is that's ailing them is surrounding them in the form of like a dark smoky vapor, like a cloud. And recognize that like you, they wish to be free of suffering. And with your next in-breath, imagine that you're drawing in that suffering directly into the heart space, transforming it at the orb of light at your heart, that indestructible nature of your own mind, bodhicitta, and sending that out, the remedy of light and healing with the out-breath. Feel that cool breeze of luminous sunlight, bringing peace, bringing resolution, offering a remedy to them. So the in-breath is the taking in of the suffering, transforming it at your heart, and the out-breath is sending out whatever the remedy may or you may intuitively feel might be, and all the while being completely free of any attachment to the outcome. So it's working the breath, working the prayer. This courage of the Bodhisattva has the courage to say, let me take on this suffering for a moment. Transform it at your heart. It doesn't hurt you. And then sending out any healing in the form of light or a cool breeze. For about five more breaths like this, focusing on this loved one.
And now bring to mind a so-called neutral person, somebody you may not really know. Maybe you see them in your neighborhood or they're a male person or somebody at the market, somebody towards whom you don't have a strong like or dislike. And see them before you as clearly as you can. Might be somebody you see taking walks in your neighborhood or see at work, but you've never met them. And just intuitively sense that they're, whatever they may be needing is something you can offer now. Maybe, maybe they're suffering in some way. See it as a dark, smoky cloud. Breathing it in, transforming it at your heart, and breathing out the remedy, the cool, clear, healing light. Feeling this kindling of tenderness towards somebody you don't even know. This willingness to care and to lighten their burden for a period of time. Really let this work on your heart, on your system. And breathing out an offering of relief from suffering. Do about five more breaths with this neutral person. And letting go of that image and now shifting to a so-called enemy, someone towards whom you may have a struggle or resistance or anger or resentment, either a person you know personally or someone you know from afar or a public figure. A so-called enemy is somebody towards whom you you feel uncomfortable feelings and bring them to mind in front of you as clearly as you can. And seeing whatever it is that ails them, whatever makes them so disagreeable, whatever causes them to suffer, surrounds them in the form of a dark smoky cloud and recognize that like you, they wish to be free of suffering, even though they may not know how to do that. We do have that in common. And for this time in this experimental meditation here, just feel what it would be like to have that courage of the Bodhisattva to inhale, taking in their suffering, transform it at your heart. And with the exhale, breathe out cool, clear light. The remedy offered to them, whatever intuitively you feel, would bring them ease, would bring them healing. And notice if you have any resistance or if you get stuck in your head here. Let go of the story and just have this unmediated direct experience of you and this so-called enemy and the courage to, for this time, take it on, transform it, 
and offer something better, offer without attachment to the outcome. Letting go as you offer. This generosity free of conditions. Generated from a sincere wish to help relieve suffering. Spend about five more breaths focusing on the so-called enemy. Now releasing that visualization and opening up to a feeling. Now we'll work with the world for a while, the global community. And one way to do this is to imagine that you're looking down upon the earth from the moon. And that this bodhicitta at your heart is as vast as the universe limitless in its expansive power and love. And seeing, like a bodhisattva, the suffering all across the world. The animals, the insects, the humans, the beings seen and unseen, all sharing this beautiful planet. And you can imagine that also the planet the suffering of and on the planet is a dark smoky cloud surrounding the world and with the in-breath like a vacuum you're drawing that in transforming it at the heart and breathing out a cosmic wind of clarity and love healing to the earth and all the inhabitants of the earth You can even imagine specific places, countries, communities, groups, animals, beings, people. Breathing it in, transforming and breathing out. Tong with the out breath, the len with the in breath. Now feel, sense, see the whole world completely purified in its natural balance of the elements and the beings within the world, upon the world, are living in balance 
They have what they need. They're free of fear and danger. Free of violence and greed. And really feel it in your heart, this potential of the human flourishing, the global flourishing. Make that prayer, may it be so. May it be so. May all beings be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. May all beings be happy and feel the causes of happiness within them. May all beings experience the unbound, limitless joy of their own true nature. And may all beings rest in equanimity, free of the extremes of attachment and aversion. And we dedicate any merit from this practice for the benefit of all. We give it away. Like a drop of water releasing into the ocean of good energy, it becomes limitless like the ocean. Thank you. Let's slowly open our eyes and come back. So when you're practicing on your own, you can go directly to just one of those categories. You know, you can um, you can go directly to the loved one if somebody is in need, or to yourself, or to the so-called enemy or neutral person. You don't have to do all those stages sequentially in every session, but for the sake of learning, it's nice to feel that trajectory. And so that's why I guided the practice in that way. What we did tonight is very common, and it's a it's the way that was popularized by Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche and Pema Chodron, who you might know. Pema Chodron, her life work really f- circles and focuses in on the Lojong teachings. This is really her wheelhouse, and she's written many books about it. She's a wonderful, wonderful resource. And I love this kind of, you know, the progressive nature of this practice, this first feeling the heart space, then breathing with the texture, then working with yourself, then a loved one, then a neutral, then a so-called enemy, and then the whole world. I mean, you can even get more cosmic than that and do the whole universe. You know, if you sense that there's more, (laughs) send it there. We don't know. It's got to be out there. (laughs) Maybe we can make some contact. So for those of you who've studied with me for a while, you know that this is really the the most uh, common way that I do and teach the Tonglen. But there are many ways to do Tonglen. As you know, if you came to last week, we did a different way. And uh, Eve may guide it in in different ways, of course. And so... um, this is all to say, let it be intuitive for yourself. When you get the basic alchemy, the understanding of what the gist is, then feel it. You know, it came a point tonight for me, like with the whole world. Like at first it was kind of visual. I felt I was on the moon. And then after a while I said, I'm just going to feel this, you know, or I don't, am I going to think it anymore? And so that felt nice to shift into more of a feeling of it rather than a visual feeling of it. So please play with it, make it your own, and use it. 
You know, when you have a fight with someone, instead of doing the same old song and dance, try this song and dance. <laughs> Just try it. Go in, or, you know, go in your room, find some quiet space, and really work it. This is where the rubber hits the road. This is when you really get to test it. And I know from firsthand experience, you know, it's one thing to kind of do it in the laboratory under controlled conditions. And it's another thing to take it out into the world and really, oh, I'm really angry right now. This is uncomfortable. Get me out of here. How do I get out of here? Oh, why don't I try some Tonglen? Let's see if it really works. <laughs> How many people have done that? Please unmute yourself and share your success stories. <laughs> it's fun to hear. You know, like, when did this come in handy? Okay, I'll, while you're thinking about your own story, I'll tell a funny story. Three or four years ago. Four years ago. It was, right, it was during the um, campaigning between Hillary Clinton and Trump. So it was before Trump got elected. I'm driving to SFDC. It was, at the time, it was against the stream back then. And I'm thinking about Lo Jong and Tong Len because I've got to teach on it that night. And I'm thinking about what does it mean? What can I share? What's meaningful? And this, I was in San Francisco, and right next to me on one of those big one-way streets, I can't remember which one, zooms by and cuts, this guy cuts me off, he's in a giant pickup truck with an American flag, and then a bumper sticker that says, lock her up. <laughs> and here I am thinking about Lo Jong, and my thought is, that bleep, 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 you know? <laughs> And I go really down the, down the, down the, you know, toilet with my thinking. And, and then I have a moment of like, ha ha, look at you, this, you know, Dharma teacher. <laughs> so I started practicing Tonglen with him. It was so juicy, really hard. I didn't want to, <laughs> really didn't want to. But it, but I, I got, I got, you know, I warmed up to it a little bit. I can't say I had this huge breakthrough because it really, you know, the whole locker up thing really made me mad. You know, really, as a woman too, you know. And so yeah, I really had to chew on that for a while. But then the Tonglen really helped ease ease up my internal atmosphere. You know, lower my blood pressure. Whether it helped him or not, I don't know. So we have to be, we have to remember that we're actually not trying to control people. Sometimes people go, oh, I felt kind of uncomfortable with this because I, I felt like I was trying to control them, control the enemy or control my loved one. That's just a misunderstanding of the, the practice. That's not what we're doing. So it's actually kind of like, how is this working on me? You know, <laughs> this is, you know, the old saying that, if you're uncomfortable walking on the earth, instead of covering the whole earth with leather, put some shoes on. It's like that. Tonglen is like that. How about you? Okay, that was my little Tonglen on the go. Did you have any stories of when it came to you and you were like, oh, I can, I can do this now. I have a question with a case study. Okay. If I can share. Yeah. Um, so, well, I guess my question first was, um, does the person need to be suffering? Because I, I tried to use it tonight with someone who, you know, I, who's actually quite upset with me and rightfully so, <laughs> um, but I, I, and I also have resentment, but I also know they're right. And so, you know, you said someone uncomfortable who's the enemy that it's very present and happened yeah. yesterday, but you know, this person's thriving. <laughs> so is it about like, do we need to imagine them suffering or is it just back to a universal truth of like, well, everybody's suffering in some way all the time, or, you know, like I got kind of caught up in the, mm, yeah. 
that mm-hmm. element of, you know, was the guy locking her up? How, did you, I mean, he probably was suffering to think that, but in this case, this is a beautiful human who I'm having friction with and is doing quite fine on his own. And so mm-hmm. I just wonder about, yeah, choosing people and, and that if they're not suffering. I see. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, no, they don't have to be like, you know, battling a disease or COVID or, you know, like it doesn't have to be a big, oh, this person that I'm working with has to be suffering. And it's true that on the, basically, if we're in a human body, we're all suffering to a certain extent, one way or another, right? I don't know about you, but that's definitely been my experience. And so you can just connect with that kind of like humanity, the mortal toil, you can say, <laughs> the coil, the toil and the coil. And and work with that. But you did say there was a little key in there because you did say that this person is irritated with you, right? Or agitated. You used a word, something like that. That's a form of suffering. <laughs> so that agitation, it, you know, could be a part of something larger. So absolutely, they don't have to be um, suffering big time. You can also work with like a loved one who you just want to spend some time helping to lighten their load. Like, for example, I'm just going to say who I worked with and my loved one tonight. I often work with my 20-year-old child. Um, They are in finals right now. And so I was breathing with to them. Uh, Tara, who uh, is probably suffering to a certain extent just studying, but I I love them so much. So I worked, I don't know if they're really suffering, and they're not suffering with some life-threatening thing. But I'm aware of that, just the suffering of humanity, and that can be enough. Yeah. I saw a chat come in. Diane, do you want to say it, or do you want to re- do you want me to read it out loud? Well, I was on my bicycle, and I really think this driver ran a red light, because I'm pretty good about stopping at lights. <laughs> and I made a turn... And this driver, I think he didn't see, I don't know, whatever, he yelled at me and he yelled this really mean swear cuss word at me that was so out of line. And I just felt kind of scared and deep, you know, rancor (laughs) was a good word. And then um, I love the eight verses of mind training, you know, because it's so contra me. But it's kind of like a, um, a zap, you know, like those bug zappers that you see advertised, you're just kind of like gone, you know, so but I know it helps. So it dissipates the smoke of whatever. So I just started thinking about it. I mean, it was like, well, I should do the Richie to him. But I started the toggling on the goat. I started that's what Pema person calls it. Yeah, it's good. And, you know, slowly that became, you know, like, and then I kept thinking of him for quite a few weeks. I would just think, oh, probably wanted to jail Hillary back when. <laughs> <laughs> but it works. Yeah. It, cause, and you know what? And I, I have a friend, we were talking about transactional dharma. And I guess mm-hmm. I do it. I do do it for a payoff. Yeah. It's, it's kind of we're human. It's hard not to want to feel better if anything, even if we can't fix that person or fix others, right? It's a transaction even if we're doing it for ourselves. I fixed me. I fixed me from being angry. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for sharing. That's great. Yeah, Tonglen on the go. That's what we're talking about here is this in the moment. And it can also be Tonglen in bed. <laughs> like sometimes when you're trying to fall asleep and you can't, just breathe it in. Do the self Tonglen. Or if it's thinking about somebody else, you might work the Tonglen with them for a while. It can help soothe and bring bring things down to a, a manageable size. Yeah. Anyone else? Juliet raised her hand, please. Yes. Um, so I've just only recently um, been joining on here because um, uh, I go to Land of Medicine Buddha and uh, Venerable Tenzin, she was substituting. And of course, where she goes, I always like to go. So I, that's when I discovered this group. 
and uh, I've been really enjoying coming here on Wednesday. So Tonglin is somewhat a pretty new concept for me. Uh, I've heard it from her before and you know, recently through um, this Wednesday, I've been doing a little bit and it's it's been really um, very nice. I've done it before bed before, you know, usually I'm thinking of my brother, he's, he's the one that I'm more concerned with, you know, he struggles a little bit more. And, and um, my, my son's, he's, he's in the Naval Academy as a sponsored mom and she has COVID right now. So in the practice, I was thinking about her as well. So it's, it's really nice, yeah. I, I don't know how it affects in the greater thing, but it, it felt good to do it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for sharing and welcome. Yeah. It's nice to have you here. And um, thank you. Yeah, the Tonglen is such a lovely treasure, uh, and um, and we it really at this time, especially when we're you know, sh SIP shelter in place, it gives us a way to feel connected with others, to feel that we're doing something good and helping people in some way. And uh, I think it's it's this is a really great time to incubate this and really work it. Okay, somebody else wanted to share? I have a story of using Tonglin that I think yeah. has profoundly changed my life. Um, who knows, because who knows what would have happened in that moment if I hadn't had that practice, but um, and it's kind of cliche, but the first time I met my mother-in-law, I was like, had such a reaction to her. <laughs> um, and immediately went to Tonglen for myself for that like intensity of reaction. Um, and it just like whoosh, chilled me out. And I was able to like not be reactive. Um, <laughs> and I mean, I'm still with my partner and I still have a relationship with my mother-in-law. So <laughs> there we are. <laughs> yes. So good to, to have a practice that helps create harmony in your, in your home. Right. I had the same thing. Uh, my greatest breakthrough was with my stepmother. So much charge, so much charge when I was younger, especially. And, and I did Tonglen with her for quite a while, and it changed me. It helped me take the higher road. And I swear to God, it changed her. I, I swear, 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 I don't know. We never had a big talk. We had a big argument, and then I just worked Tonglen for a while. And next time I saw her, she was so sweet to me. <laughs> and we have gotten along ever since. Who knows, you know, who knows what happened there. But uh, definitely, this is a good practice for family members. <laughs> Thank you for sharing, Lily. Okay, we have somebody in the chat. A question from L. <laughs> Following you obsessively, Chandra, on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Great. Um, thank you. Thank you. Okay, the question is, I'm wondering if you or anyone else can recommend other metta tonglen sanghas for the other days of the week. Wow, good, good on you. It's so nice to sit with a group. Uh, I don't know off the top of my head. I don't know about uh, weekly metta tonglen. Maybe somebody else in the sangha. If you do, please chat it in. Maybe there's uh, more Vipassana-based community doing a regular metta is more of their common practice. Tonglen's more within the Tibetan community. It's more of a, it's a Mahayana practice that came from India with Atisha, Dipamkara, in the 11th century. He brought these teachings to Tibet, and they, they took hold in Tibet and were developed by many great masters. And uh, one of the great texts, the one that we're really working with primarily here, is with uh, Chekawa Yeshe Dorje. Chekawa Yeshe Dorje and that is the, you can find the translation of, of, of this in many different books, but the kind of good old workhorse that I go to time and time again is Pema Chodron's commentary called Start Where You Are. 
Start Where You Are by Pema Chodron. It's her very kind of accessible, colloquial, street smart commentary, and yet also very deep. So I would I would get some books too. If you can't find a sangha, get some books. But um, you might want to check Spirit Rock. You might want to check IMS, Insight Meditation Society. Um, gee, that's all I've got. But I'll think more on that. Okay, great. So two more messages. Okay, and then we'll we'll go to our next slogan in a moment. Um, yeah. Yeah, maybe she was doing Tonglen. I doubt it. But something happened. Right, and Noam did say that we do have a peer sit every morning here at SFDC at 7.30 a.m. It's very supportive. So, But I think that's silent, right? Right, Noam? Which is nice, too. Uh, what's the difference? Ted asks, what's the difference between metta practice using oneself, a loved one, neutral enemy, and using it with Tonglen. Okay, so it's the same architecture. But Tonglen, you can say, is is more like, um, I wanted to say more edgy, but the reason I say that is because with the Tonglen, you're doing metta with the out-breath, right? May you be well. You're sending that love, that prayer, that the remedy with the out-breath. So I think of Tonglen as part metta, and then with the in-breath, that, that's what makes it Tonglen, is that you're, you're like, I'm not just going to wish well for everybody, or self, loved one, neutral, enemy, the world. I'm actually also going to take a step deeper into, the, into my potential courage, bodhisattva heart, and see if I can actually say, I'm going to take this from you for a moment and I'm going to transform it at my heart and then I'm going to offer healing and the remedy for you so in that sense it's more edgy I've conceptualized potentially doing a course one day where we start with metta you know of course always starting with shamatha and the foundational practices shamatha vipassana enhancing that with the metta practice of loving kindness then doing Tonglen, which is a compassion practice. If you're familiar with the four immeasurables, you've got love, compassion, joy, and equanimity. So these practices I'm talking about address the first two, love or loving kindness, metta, and then compassion, karuna. So Tonglen is a karuna practice. Compassion differs from love in that it's love is may you be well. Compassion, from a Buddhist perspective, is May you be free of suffering. That's how the Buddhists delineate the difference between the two. And then, and then after Tonglen, I would also teach feeding your demons, and then the Chud practice. <laughs> That's more Vajrayana. But all of them work from the same alchemical process of exchanging self from other to undermine the habitual tendency we all have for self-clinging. And this is what Tonglen and Metta and um, the, all the Lojong slogans and even Dharma across the board is all geared towards that fundamental, you can say that the disease we have of ego fixation, self-clinging and identifying with the small sense of self. And so the Lojong masters, you know, they say, you know Dharma is working on you if your self-clinging is lessening and your care for others, your compassion and concern for others is increasing, is growing. El says, how is, tong it says tangled, but I assume you mean Tonglen. <laughs> how is Tonglen different than Metta? Ditto. Why do we start with Vipassana instead of starting with Metta? Well, Shamatha Vipassana are usually kind of like two wings of a bird. You know, with the meditative development, it said, you know, without concentration, you don't have much. So you can do concentration, a.k.a. Shamatha, um, mindfulness practice, you could call it, 
uh, using a lot of different tools, right? You can use the breath, you could use visualization, you can use mantra recitation. You could actually develop shamatha using metta. Okay, so this is this might take us till the end of the class. <laughs> then vipassana is always coupled with shamatha because they say shamatha is good and important, but it's not enough because it doesn't uproot the ego fixation. It doesn't uproot ignorance. That's why vipassana is needed because vipassana literally means clear seeing, insight, Right? V pasana. Pasana is to see V is special. So it's special sight. And what that refers to is seeing into the nature of reality, seeing into impermanence, recognizing that all phenomena, including your own mind, are empty of intrinsic existence. So this is deep, you know, and, and a direct experience of insight is an experience, it's, it's a, not a thought, it's an experience of that shunyata, of emptiness, which is actually a vibrant fullness of interconnected luminosity. You know, it's not like a, a void. So that's a whole, that's, that's a very interesting topic. And even in the, um, you know, one of my main mentors, Alan Wallace, who is kind of like the king of shamatha. Like that's the main thing that he teaches. He teaches shamatha. How many people have studied with Alan? Can you raise your hand? Anyone? He's amazing. You could find him free podcasts on podcast apps, uh, lots of online teachings. He gives a lot of his dharma totally for free. And he's like a teacher's teacher. Anyway, he's was he's my one of my main mentors. And he was the Dalai Lama's translator, still is, from time to time. He said to His Holiness, I want to help Westerners achieve shamatha. And His Holiness the Dalai Lama said, that's fine, but you have to make sure they understand that, that shamatha only takes you so far because it doesn't uproot ignorance. It needs to be augmented with vipassana. Because with vipassana, it's like the solvent that helps release the self-clinging, the illusion of the small sense of self. And we o merge into the ocean of the large universal experience, the Buddha nature. But then, but those are just more kind of like, those are interesting, but we have to develop the heart. And so he, th His Holiness said to Alan, augment shamatha vipassana with the four measurables. Love, metta, compassion, karuna, joy, mudita, and equanimity, upeka or upeksha in Sanskrit. So we, we all, we have to develop the heart. And yet if we just develop the heart and we have no mental stability, no attention span, it's not going to get very far, and it's not going to be very effective. Likewise, if we have heart, and even if we have shamatha, but we're still solidified, right? If we're still reifying appearances, we're still reifying thoughts, feelings, my ego, your ego, it's not going to get you very far either. So all of these things are very important. But we don't have to think of them linearly. Linearly, it's actually all like a sort of wheel coming back around. You may practice Tonglen for a while, then you might say, you know, I just want to rest and just simple breath awareness. Then you may spend some time doing that. Yeah, Diane says she watches Alan Wallace. It's B. Alan Wallace, not Alan B. Wallace, by the way. But it's at B. Alan Wallace on YouTube. Yeah, that's great. So, let me let me get you through this last little slogan because then it will complete the fifth point and then I believe yeah, Eve is the, in next week. She'll come next week to teach and she'll be able to 
dive into the sixth point with you. So we're in the fifth point of the seven point mind training text of Chekawa Yeshe Dorje. Earlier, Diane mentioned the eight point mind training, which is another wonderful text, another wonderful um, version, just slightly different way of organizing the slogans with different slogans too. You, if you continue your studies with Thonglen, maybe some of you already know this, there are many different texts, teachers, traditions, and this is just one that I said earlier is popularized by Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche and Pema Chodron. So we have, in the fifth point, there were only four slogans. Remember, we talked about this last week. And we talked about the 21st slogan, always maintain only a joyful mind, which actually goes with the next slogan, 22, that we're focusing mainly on tonight which is, if you can practice even when distracted, you are, are well trained. That's one translation of it. I'm going to post these two slogans. And I think, uh, Noam, don't we have this PDF on our web page too? Can you confirm that? I, I said that to the group last week, but I haven't seen it lately. I saw it a few months ago. Um, I want to make sure people have this, that they can get it for free and don't have to buy a book if they can't or don't want to. But there's a PDF that should be accessible to you on the Well of Being website. Um, and we will confirm that. Right. Okay, we'll con <laughs> you can't do it while he's recording. Okay. Did Diane, did you just paste that? Is that what just got pasted? In any case, you've got it pasted in your chat. And this these, these two go together, so I'm going to kind of lump them together in my talk here. So if you remember anything from these teachings, please remember that the whole point of Lo Zhong, and of all Dharma practice for that matter, is to transform the way you relate to the world, out of reactivity and into a more expansive um, approach or mentality. In other words, as one of the slogans said earlier, to transform adversity and all your joy, all your adversity, into the path of awakening. So we don't leave anything out here. We don't leave anything out. It's not like we just want the bliss and we avoid the pain. It's not like we go s looking for pain. <laughs> but when it comes our way, we've trained to recognize the opportunity. So the whole point is that, is to transform adversity and joy onto into the path of awakening, to use it as fuel. And as I already said, it's also to reduce the self-fixation, the self-clinging, and increase compassion and care for self and other. Bodhicitta. In a nutshell, that's your elevator speech to a friend who says, what is lojong? That's what you can say. And you're going to be tested on this at the end of the class. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so remember, as stated in the last class, the near enemy of compassion is sadness or pity. So pity is the more classic definition. Some translators say sadness, but it's this kind of like depression we can get into, and then we get stuck in that. Or self-pity or pitying others, you know, like pity is very different than compassion for others. So if we meet, if we can meet that, if we're experiencing sadness or pity, we meet it, we let it be there, we feel what it is, and we have... If we can, we yield to that. We don't fight it. We actually yield to it, which may be counterintuitive because you think if I yield to it, it will consume me. But there's an old saying, that which we resist persists. So if we can learn to yield to that feeling of sadness, depression, when you hear about the suffering of the world, for example, or when you look at our political situation and COVID, everything, it's pretty dire. So let it be there, listen to it, 
And then once you've done that, you've really done it, once that moment or those moments have come to fruition, then feel that actually this isn't the end point. This, this experience is a bridge. It's a bridge to something else. It's a bridge to healing, but it's also a bridge to a more authentic feeling of compassion. So in the Dharma teachings, it says that this sadness or this near enemy of pity slash sadness should be perceived whenever you can as a bridge to compassion. And then the question is, how can I help? How can I be of service? Whether it's how can I help my angry little girl? Or how can I help, meaning my inner little girl? (laughs) Or how can I help you out there? So this dynamic of yielding and then exertion, exerting. Yield, exert. Knowing there's a time to yield and to feel it and a time to take a step. How can I help? Especially when we're faced with hardship and so on. Um, there's an old saying by one of the great Mahayana masters, Shanti Deva. Some of you probably have studied him. He wrote the, the Bodhisattva Way of Life, a classic Mahayana text. There's a saying in that text, Mahayana, the, uh, the Bodhisattva Way of Life. He says, if there is a remedy, then what is the use of frustration? If there's no remedy, then what is the use of frustration? Essentially, it's so simple. We don't, what's the use of freaking out? (laughs) If there's a solution to the problem, why worry about it then? If there's no solution to the problem, then you don't need to be frustrated. So essentially, when a problem arises, either you can do something about it or you can't. If you can do something, then do it. But if there's nothing you can do, being miserable doesn't help. That's another way of understanding that. So these two slogans of always maintain a joyful attitude is pointing to what I was just talking about. Like how do we transform adversity onto the path? That's really what that slogan is pointing to. How do we use these experiences as fuel for our process of opening and awaking and maturing? But then the second slogan, number 22, if this can be done, even when distracted, you are proficient. That's one uh, translation. And it's referring to the prior slogan, if you can transform adversity onto the path and joy onto the path, even when you're distracted, then you've trained well, is what they're saying. And this is so interesting. I looked at the Tibetan. I don't always have time to look at the Tibetan, but I looked at the Tibetan here because the distraction, like when you can practice when you're distracted, that's good. I get that. But like if you're distracted, are you practicing? (laughs) Are you lost somewhere? The word in Tibetan is yeng. Yang, which does mean distraction, but it also means to waver, to oscillate, to wander. The image is like a, a little candle flame buffeted in the wind. So the image that comes to me when I think of this is like, if you can st- practice in the midst of the storm, then this is a sign that your training is working with on you, that mind training is growing in you, maturing in you. So when, when we really get a challenge, whether it's the guy with the locker up or with real personal attacks, maybe there's a personal dynamic of heartbreak that's happening. If you can maintain your practice through that, this is a good sign. The whole, remember, the whole point in the, these four slogans here in point five are like measures of how your mind training is going. So that's why this last slogan is saying, if you can practice in the midst of the storm, if you can practice in the midst of distraction, the yangwa, the yang, then 
you are proficient, then you are trained, you have trained well. So if you have trained well, meaning if you've been mindful, if you've really let these practices take root in you, if you have a regular meditation practice, one of my teachers says, it's hard to have the post-meditation experience without the meditative experience. <laughs> you've got to have your ass on cushion. It's called AOC, and you've got to do it. <laughs> ass on cushion. Now, I don't care if it's five minutes or 50 minutes or two hours a day. Just find a way. Put a piece of chocolate on your cushion. Do whatever the hell you need to do to get yourself on that cushion. You know, scientific studies show that, that frequency trumps duration. Okay? So if you practice five minutes every day, it has more of a beneficial effect in learning whatever it is that you're practicing, whether it's meditation, piano, a language. It has a greater benefit than just two hours on the weekend, you know. So a little bit every day. Some chocolate. <laughs> so if you've trained well, a little bit every day. And you can practice even when wavering, the yang is happening. So maybe just remember that word. And then when you're feeling distracted or chaotic or the world is swirling around you it's just oh that's the yang that's the yang can i practice in the midst of the yang the wavering the movement the wandering whether it's your own mind or the world around you so if you can integrate and another way of saying it is if you can integrate everything onto the path and stay awake to it even when you are buffeted by the storm, this is a good thing. This is an indication that mind training is taking root and maturing in you. Remember, mindfulness is so important. Shamatha trains in that. Also, different forms of modern-day Vipassana trains in that. Um, and the word in Tibetan is drenpa, drenpa, which literally means to remember. So it's a, it's a training to remember, oh, I don't have to go down that route. I can stay. I can go this way. And come to home to my breath. I can practice Tonglen or Metta. So mindfulness is very important here. And that's that age-old image of the candle buffeted in the wind. Mindfulness meditation is like putting a nice kind of votive around that so that the candle flame can be nice and still. Another way of putting this is let distraction remind you to practice Tonglen or Shamatha, whatever you practice. Let distraction, the Yangwa, be your mindfulness bell, as Thich Nhat Hanh would say. Isn't that a cool idea? Can we train ourselves to make the thing that we usually think is our ruin be our mindfulness bell, our reminder? or drenpa, to come back to our practice. You could breathe in the challenge, and breathe out the good, tonglen on the go, doesn't have to be fancy, and use distraction to bring you back to the moment. That's to be celebrated. That's what's called the miracle of mindfulness. And then last, I wanted to, s to end with some wonderful advice from Pema Chodron. She's so great. And she's always telling us to lighten up. So she urges us to lighten up, relax around your resistance to whatever it is that's causing you strife. Resistance to the truth of what is, is more painful than the simple experience of anger, sadness, guilt, emptiness, loneliness. That's my paraphrase of Pema Chodron. That it's the resistance that's more painful than the actual thing itself. So let that be your mindfulness bell. Let resistance be your mindfulness bell. Relax the struggle. Settle the mind in its natural state. You know how to do that. Rest in that natural mind. It's not fancy. 
It's always there with you. It's not a big deal. She also says, stay awake and open to spaciousness. Have a sense of humor, enjoyment, even in the midst of adversity. Be curious. And let distraction bring you back to the practice of Tonglen. Because as long as you're coming to this Wednesday night class, you can consider yourself a Lojong practitioner. And Tonglen is your main thing. <laughs> We're like, we're like the Lojong Club. So, so really like let Tonglen be your knee-jerk reaction to the world if you can for a while. Try it on. When in doubt, practice Tonglen when you're standing in the coffee shop line for your coffee. If you're frustrated with, your, with the guy making the coffee because he's not making your coffee, it seems like he's making everybody else's coffee. Instead of being angry, just stand there and practice Tonglen. Use that as a, oh, I get to meditate. You see? This is the alchemy. And this is when you move from being a beginner to an intermediate meditator. <laughs> or maybe advanced. You know, because you're breathing, bringing it into your daily life. That's the real challenge. That's upping the ante. So we're at time now. So thank you, everyone. Good luck with your assignment. <laughs> and um, have fun with Eve next week. And I'll see you the week after. I think we're teaching together after that. So be well. Take care. Thank you, Noam, for hosting. Thanks, SFDC. And uh, we'll see you in a couple weeks. Lots of love. Yeah. Ciao, ciao.